Good morning, Rock Church. How are you guys doing? Uh, to somebody in the house, I think there's somebody in the house who can say that God is good. Is there anybody in the house that can declare this morning with a hand praise that God is great? Is there anybody else that can de declare with a hallelujah that God is amazing? Hallelujah. hallelujah. He's in the house. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Uh, I want to uh, first uh, open by being able to say thank you uh, to Rachel and Brandon. They, you know, it, it, you said six months, you said it in the early service. But I was like, it's, it's just been six months for real? <laughs> like, I was talking to my wife the other day and uh, I was saying, she was asking me, okay, so I know your friends outside of the city, but who are your friends in this city? She's like, people that you enjoy spending time with and people who reciprocate that love back to you. And Brandon and Rachel, you guys were the, the first two people that I mentioned. I am very grateful, and this relationship has come at a critical time for me and a time where I'm doing a lot of thinking. Right now, I'm on sabbatical from my church. Um, I took a complete break from ministry, and uh, the only ministry appointment that I have kept during that sabbatical is this one on today because I just believe in what God is doing here and I love your pastor and his wife so much that this is not work for me. This is just a joy to be here with you. So can we put our hands together for the leadership here at the Rock Church? Our pastor and his wife. So very grateful. Let's talk to the Lord. Dear Lord and Father, we just want to thank you so much. I pray that your Holy Spirit will be here, um, that you will be present, and that you will speak. Thank you so much for being here already. I pray that you will transform those who are here in this room and make us troublemakers. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm not in very many venues where we have the multiple service thing going on. And the way that I preach, I preach until my larynx is about to come flying out of my mouth and I just have nothing left. So that's what I did at the nine o'clock service. So what you're gonna get is just whatever is left over, hallelujah. No, I believe that the Holy Spirit is here as well. I was in the seat and I was struggling because there was uh, another message that was on my heart that I wanted to share with you. Uh, the message would be the message of the potter in, Je in Jeremiah 18. If I was going to share that message, what I would have said, and I think it's appropriate for someone who is in this house, is in that text, God sends Jeremiah to the master potter's house. Because notice in the text, he says, go to the potter's house. There were tons of potters. But when he says the potter, Jeremiah doesn't have to ask which one, which means the potter's house that he goes to is the famous potter, the potter, the man. And when he goes to the house, God shows him a pot that's in process. God does not allow him to go see a finished product. He allows him to go see a pot that is in process. Is there anybody in the house that's in process right now? So then the word says that while this pot is in process, the pot is marred. In other words, the pot is cracked. It is something's wrong with the pot. But read the text. It says it's marred in the hands of the potter. Now, if you're going to be messed up anywhere, is there anybody in the house that knows if I'm going to be messed up anywhere, I want to be messed up in his hands. Because if he's the master potter, master potters don't just know what to do with perfect clay. Is there anyone that knows that a master potter knows exactly what to do with messed up clay? So then it says that he forms it, he shapes it. The, the idea of forming is a squeezing. The idea of a stretching is a pulling. So imagine that with messed up clay, what God does to rework messed up clay is that he doesn't throw it away. He forms it. He shapes it with his hands, and then he stretches it. I don't know if there's anybody in the house today, and I know that God told me to share this with someone, but there's somebody in the house today that's going through a forming and a stretching. And today, what I want to let you know is that God sent me here to let you 
you know first don't get out of his hands. You're, you're thinking about jumping off the potter's wheel. I'm going to finish this. I'm going to preach two sermons this morning. Is that all right? This all right? You shouldn't have given me the mic. All right? So uh, on that potter's wheel, that potter's wheel, uh, the potter's wheel that he used, there was a big wheel on the top and there was a small wheel on the bottom. The top, and he would push the small wheel, the potter would push the small wheel with his foot and then shape on top. The challenge is that if you are on that big wheel on the top, you can't see what's happening below. So you feel as if the wheel is out of control because you can't see what's happening below. You can't see that the foot of the master potter is literally controlling the speed at which the wheel spins. So you're liable to say that your life is out of control. But I came to tell that person who is in the house today, your life is not out of control. You're not just spinning out of control. There's a God in heaven that is literally controlling the speed of the wheel that you're on so don't get out of his hands and don't get off the wheel touch the person next to you and say don't get out of his hands <laughs> and then look back behind you and point at someone and say don't get off the wheel don't give up all right so that's not my sermon <laughs> uh. The sermon that I came to deliver, I want to warn you, is a uh, challenging sermon. But it's not just a challenging sermon for you. It's a challenging sermon for me as well. This is not a finger pointing sermon. This is a, a sermon where all five of my fingers are pointed squarely at my own life. But. Uh, I was talking to someone from the first service, and he was like, man, when you started, I was like biting my lips. I was like, eh, eh, this don't feel good. <laughs> but he stayed on the train. And when we finally arrived, he said, I was so glad that I was here. Will you go on a journey with me this morning? Will you, will you go on a journey with me this morning? If you will, let's pray again. Father, we're on the train with you. Speak. We're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Open up your Bibles to the book of Acts. We're going to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. So grateful to be here this morning. Acts chapter 16, and we're looking at verse 16. And we're going to study that word on today and see what God wants to say. Yep. So I'm reading from the screen. It says, now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed by the spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. Someone say many days. But Paul greatly annoyed. Someone shout out annoyed turned and said to the spirit I command you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and he came out of her that very hour my my daughter went and found this box my wife and I have this box at home that could that in it we put all of our trinkets from our dating time and the box is full because I was an amazing boyfriend <laughs> amazing amazing with an extra m I'm, 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 amazing I was amazing she went in and she pulled something out and she said, Dad, what's this? And I was like, you got to be kidding me. You don't know what that is? She's like, no, I've never seen it before. I said, it's film, film, <laughs> film. She said, well, what's film? I was like, you don't know what film is? I was like, before you had cell phones with the screens and all of that, before you had the digital cameras, you would take pictures. And when we got high tech, they had those uh, disposable ones. Yeah, you remember those? You remember going to Walmart? Nobody, nobody, nobody remembers going to Walmart, putting the disposable in the envelope, dropping it off at the counter. Hello. And when they got good, you would get your pictures back in a day. Hello. No. There's too many millennials in this church. <laughs> she didn't know what film was. Just like she doesn't know what a cassette deck is. 
She barely knows what a, what a CD and a CD player is. And she has no idea what MapQuest is. <laughs> MapQuest. Back in the day when you were going on a journey, you did not have a GPS. Someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. My brother right there, you know what it's like to use MapQuest. You would get online, you'd put in your address, and then after putting the address, it would print off all the directions. Hallelujah, yeah, yeah. And then after printing off the directions, you would take all 10 pages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put it up, stick it up on the dashboard so you can't see out the window. <laughs> oh, MapQuest was amazing. The problem with MapQuest is that it didn't have the ability to reroute you. So that if you got lost, MapQuest did nothing to help you get found. <laughs> yeah. Ju Paul and Silas are on a journey. And on this journey, they are deciding that they're going to go do a good thing. They're going to do a holy thing. They're going to do a spiritual thing. They're going to do a moral thing. They're even going to do a mission-minded thing. They want to go to a city to preach the gospel. And someone say amen to that. Oh, that's a really good thing. But does anybody in the house know that sometimes good things are not God things? Like you can make a good decision, a moral decision, a right decision, but that good moral and right decision does not line up with God's purposes for your life at this moment or in this season. And so what the Holy Spirit does is that the Holy Spirit does a GPS reroute of their route and tells them, I don't want you to go over there. I want you to go over here. The Holy Spirit literally interrupts them on the way to preach a revival and says, don't preach a revival over there. I want you to preach an, a revival over there. I'm wondering if there's anybody in the house that's bold enough to say to God right now, God, I'm going to allow you to reroute where I'm going reroute what I'm doing take me out of a good thing and put me into a God thing God I don't I don't want good I don't want better I want your best I want to know what it is you want for my life I don't want to just be shooting you know in the dark I don't want to be like like thinking that well maybe this might be it or maybe no God I want you to order my steps because your word says that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by God God I want you to order my steps to route my in fact I want the voice on my spiritual GPS to be so loud that it drowns out the music that's trying to distract me from your presence the Holy Spirit literally reroutes them from where they're going and they're not going to a bad place they're going to do good things and says those are good things but let me introduce you to God things I'm praying that for someone today and even while we talk through this sermon I want you to think about all the good things you're doing and I want you to ask yourself this is a good thing but is it a God thing yeah and so they get they get rerouted, and they re, they're rerouted to a city. And when they show up in this city, it does not take long for them to figure out why they are there. Because the Bible says that when they end up in this city, as soon, someone say immediately. Immediately. As soon as they receive the word from God, they respond to God. They don't say to themselves, well, I need to pray about it. They don't go seek their pastor to ask their pastor what he thinks about it. The Bible says that when they received God's revelation, they responded immediately. That is really important because sometimes when God shares with us what he wants us to do, our response, my sister, is, well, let me pray about it. Help me to understand that. You're going to pray to God about what God already said. In those cases, what I think is that it's not prayer. What it really is, is spiritual procrastination. Because God has already shared with you. He's already given you the answer. He's already told you what to do. You don't need to pray. You need to walk. You don't need to pray. You need to move. You don't need to pray. You need to sacrifice. I know that there's some person in the house today that can agree with me that sometimes you fast and you pray about what God has already said. And when you procrastinate with prayer, it's still sin. 
one more time. When you use prayer as a form of procrastination, it's still sin. Sin is the refusal to do what God has told you to do. So even when you spiritualize sin, it's still sin. I hope I'm not losing you this morning. Well, if you're still with me, say woohoo. Woo yes, God. The Bible says that in 1610 that these men respond immediately. Somebody shout out immediately. immediately. Touch the person next to you. Say God wants you to respond right now, right now, right now. And as soon as they respond, watch what happens. They get to the city and the Bible says that when they arrive at the city, they go to prayer. Whew, this is deep. They go to prayer and at prayer, they meet a slave girl at the church. They go to the church and there's a girl at the church who is currently enslaved at the church. It says that she's a slave girl. The word that's used is paideon. That word paideon doesn't just say that she's a slave, but says that she's a young girl, which suggests that this girl was enslaved for her entire life. She had no idea what it was like to be free. She was either born into slavery or sold into slavery at a very young age. She is a slave girl. She did not ask for it. She did not earn it. She didn't do some sin to deserve it. She is just a slave girl. That is all she knows. What messed me up is that this slave girl is a slave girl at the house of God. I want you to picture it. It means that while they were singing, you are good, good, oh yeah, and hands were going up. Her hands were going up, but her feet were shackled, sitting next to someone who was next to her, who was free. There was a woman in the house of God who was a slave. Now answer this for me. How is it that spiritual people are okay with the injustices of people who are sitting in the pew right next to them. How? How? How is it that this young girl is able to be enslaved and everyone around her is okay with the injustices that are being met out in her life in their very faces? Do you imagine that this girl going home was chained to the back of somebody's wagon while everyone was going home saying, oh, worship was so amazing. She's chained to the back of her master's wagon to be dragged home, to be whipped, to not know who her family is. And all of the Christians were okay with it. This is not a new story. In fact, some of the things we don't talk about is within the history of our own country, one of the institutions that supported slavery the most, that fought for it, was the church. We use scripture, the Bible, to support the enslavement of other people. Chained, enslaved, in the church, and sometimes by the church. Stories of pastors who preached freedom, who the sun set free, is free indeed, and then went home to whip their slaves. She was enslaved in the church and also by the church. The Bible continues, though, and tells us a little bit more about her. So her, her position was that she was a slave. 
But her condition, the Bible is very specific about telling us about her condition. The condition says that she was possessed by the spirit of divination. Uh, That word spirit of divination, it comes from this idea. There was this Greek God called Apollo and this Greek God called Apollo had these servants of Apollo that would minister at the temple. These servants that ministered at the temple, when the spirit of Apollo would get upon them, they would writhe almost like if they were being squeezed in pain. So that word spirit of divination is derived from actually a Greek term and it's not spirit of divination. It is called the spirit of Python. Someone say Python. Touch the person next to you and say, there's a snake involved in this story. <laughs> yes, the spirit of Python. All right, so, so now it's not the spirit of cobra. It's not the spirit of rat- rattlesnake. It's the spirit of python. Snakes kill in two distinct ways. Uh, snakes can either kill by venom. That means that their prey dies from the inside out. Or snakes, snakes can There are constrictor snakes that kill their prey by squeezing their prey from the outside in. Uh, What they do is that they squeeze the prey so the prey cannot breathe. And then they squeeze the prey a little bit longer so that the blood will no longer flow to the heart. It is a very difficult and painful and long death. And it's oftentimes worse than the death of venom. Because venom kills you from the inside out. But constrictors kill you from the outside in. Mm. It says that this girl was under the spirit of Python. And the spirit of Python is a spirit that squeezes you from the outside in. It cuts off your airwaves. And then after cutting off your airwaves... Listen to this. It stops the flow of the blood. So that while the church is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and the fact that Jesus was crucified uh, on Calvary and his blood flowed for our community, there are parts of our community that cannot receive it. Why? Because they're being squeezed by the spirit of Python. And when you're squeezed by the spirit of Python, the blood can't flow squeezed sacramental right now is top 10 in the united states of america when it comes to sex exploitation of children squeezed the homeless population in our city is climbing through the roof squeezed and it's all happening on the steps of the church So that people are being squeezed and rather than seeking to set them free, the church is standing up and preaching, come to Jesus just like you are and stay just like you are because we're okay with you being exactly the way you are. Just fill the church and sit in a seat. The spirit of Python. It's all around us. We drove past the spirit of Python this morning when we passed the young man on the corner who right now is probably trying to find shelter under some little eave or some little awning or some little tree where the only thing he owns is what he stored from our garbage and is in his shopping cart and he can't put it anywhere because if he does, it's going to get thrown away and he'll have to start over again. That is the spirit of Python and is squeezing the life out of our communities and while the spirit of python is squeezing the life out of our communities our churches are happy to sing worship songs and telling the community come worship with us but ignoring the slave sitting in the seat right next to us someone say ouch i'm not just talking about you I'm talking about myself too. So we're going to take one more step in this text. 
I was really disturbed by this text even more. Actually more than just the church. I don't know, have you guys seen that movie where Superman and Batman end up fighting? You seen it? Oh, that was a disturbing movie. It was a disturbing movie because I love Superman. Clark Kent. I mean, I'm married and I love my wife, but that dude is a hunk. It was really hard to watch Clark, to watch Clark Kent, my hero, Superman, like completely turn dark. I think that scarred my mental faculties. I just, there's a problem. And then Wolverine, my wife loves Wolverine. She loves Wolverine so much that I went to Old Navy and I bought a Wolverine shirt and I would wear it around the house because I figured if the spirit of Wolverine could be my spirit, then my wife is going to love me like she loves him. It didn't work though. <laughs> Did you see the last Wolverine movie where like he just doesn't want to be a superhero? Like I'm like, what is this? Dude, do you know who you are? Felt the same way when I read this text. I'm going to tell you why. Because Paul is one of my biblical superheroes. So it's in this text right here. I want you to read what it says. It says, but Paul greatly, it says um, that this woman followed, this is the beginning. Now it happened that as we went to prayer, Paul goes to the house of prayer, that a servant, certain slave girl possessed by the spirit of divination met us who brought, us, who brought her master's profit for fortune telling. This, this girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, ha, huh, and she did it for many days. So Paul is focused on preaching a revival, and when he's focused on preaching a revival, there's a girl behind him who's in need of help, and Paul allows this girl to be in that spirit and to be in that condition for many days. Paul misses his purpose. Churches are looking around, and they're looking for the next new thing, and what are we going to do, and what building are we going to build, and, and how many thousands are we going to have, and, and what, what newfangled thing are we going to do when the purpose of the church has been following it the whole time. If you just look over your shoulder and see what God has been doing and see the people that God has been sending, your purpose is following you. It's not ahead of you. Look behind Look behind you. Your purpose is chasing you down. The Bible says goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Follow me. And we're chasing some big idea of what church is supposed to be. Where God is saying no. The church, the purpose of the church has been chasing you while you've been chasing stardom. It's right behind you. Just look over your shoulder. The opportunities for ministry and for sharing the gospel are chasing you and you are running away from them. Paul was sent to this city and he was sent to this city not to preach a revival but to experience a revival. And the whole time revival was chasing Paul, Paul was chasing something else. Question I have for you today at the Rock Church is whether or not this church is really chasing revival. Because if you're chasing revival, revival is chasing after you. God is sending people your way. God is sending issues your way. He's giving you something that irritates you for more than a second on CNN. So that you are on Fox or on MSNBC. That you could just shut off and think about something else. God is saying, no, I want you to be able to see that I'm sending purposes, issues to your doorstep. And those issues are going to shake you to the, to the core those issues are going to make you feel uncomfortable but is there anybody in the house that's willing to say to God I'm willing to be uncomfortable in order to walk in your purposes the purpose was chasing him he wasn't wise enough to look over his shoulder to see it but then the Bible says something so sweet it's so sweet that can anybody agree with me that the, the word of God is so good it's so good so good so Paul my superhero is is annoy is is uh ignoring it but the Bible says uh the Bible says and this she did for many days until Paul became greatly annoyed the word says agitated that's the actual the actual Greek word says that he was bothered bothered well, you're not going to understand that word until I tell you about when I get bothered. 
So I got three kids. And I got a middle one that likes to ask a lot of questions. And he's not here today, and none of you guys know who he is, so you're not going to tell him what I'm about to say, right? 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 He annoys, the, he annoys me. <laughs> he's always asking questions, and his questions always come at the wrong time. I just got home from work. I am tired. I'm paying the bills. I drove through traffic. I come into the house. He says, hey, daddy, um, you want to play? I said, no. What I really want to do is sit here. I want to watch ESPN. My Raptors are destroying the Golden State Warriors. And my Seahawks are about to kill the 49ers. So what I want to do is I want to sit here and watch TV. And he says, hey, daddy, but I want to play. I said, well, that's nice. What I want to do is I want to sit on the couch and I want to watch TV. He comes back two minutes later and says, hey, daddy, you want to play? I'm like, boy, I'm about to beat you into Never Never Land. I just really want to sit on the couch and just watch TV. That's what I want to do. Two minutes later, he's like, hey, daddy, I really want to play. I'm about to rearrange the teeth in your mouth. I just want to sit and watch TV, please. He said, but daddy, I want to play. I said, okay, we'll play tomorrow. It just came in my mouth. We just go away. We'll play tomorrow. The next day, I get home. I worked hard at work, and I drove through traffic. All I want to do is watch TV. When the garage door goes up, my son is standing in the garage ready to play. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He said, daddy, today we're going to play. You said we're going to play. I said, well, I had another hard day. I want to sit and watch TV. He said, but daddy, you said that you were going to play with me today. I said, yeah, but I didn't know what my day was going to be like, and now I know what my day was going to be like. I don't want to play. He said, but daddy, you said we would play. I said, I don't want to play. He said, daddy, you promised. So I got home. I put down my bag, put on a pair of shorts. We went and we played. <laughs> Save your applause. I wasn't happy about it. Now, we understand that in prayer, the Bible suggests that we ask and knock and keep knocking so that God answers our prayers. Amen? But we don't understand that the same thing works in the opposite direction, that the Holy Spirit will also come and ask, knock, and agitate, and ask, and not, and agitate, and keep knocking on your door until you answer and do what God has called you to do. This is not a one-way street. God is saying, I'm asking you to do that to me, and I'm also going to do it to you. I want to agitate you. I want you to get angry about something. I want you to decide that something on your block, something in your city must change. And I will not stop knocking at your door. I will not stop banging on your heart until you feel some tear in your body. I will not let you sleep. And I will not let you have peace. Because there's a slave girl that has been sitting next to you in the church, standing on the corner, right over there in Roseville. And I need you to be the answer. So Paul gets agitated. And after Paul gets agitated, only when Paul gets agitated, he turns around to that little girl and he realizes that one, he had to see what the problem was. Two, he had to be agitated by the problem. But number three, he had to believe that he was the answer. Notice what the Bible says. It doesn't say that Paul has to pray about it. It doesn't say that there's some spirit that comes upon Paul. <laughs> don't, don't miss it. Because the answer that the girl needed was always in Paul. He always had the ability 
ability to turn around and to use the power that God had placed in his life to set her free. All he needed to know was that that was God's will and he had to be agitated enough to be uncomfortable, agitated enough to take the step, agitated enough to do what God had been calling him to do because the answer was always in him. The answer to the problems in Roseville will never be solved at the Capitol in Sacramento. The answer to the issues in our country are not in the White House or the Black House or the Green House or the Red House. The answer to the issues in our country will not be solved by Republicans or Democrats. The answer to the issues in our country are not solved by politics or science. The answers to the issues in our country are not in education. The answers to the issues in our country are in birth, in the belly of the church. We are the answer. It's in us. The Holy Spirit does not just exist for us to lift our hands and enjoy the song said the Holy Spirit that causes you to lift your hands should always cause you to move your feet. And if all we're doing is lifting our hands, my question is, is that the Holy Spirit? Or are you just having a good time, emotional time? Because that Holy Spirit that I know causes people to lift their hands and then move their feet. She's enslaved. and The church has been ignoring her. She's hurting. And the church has been having a party. The church has been asking, what is our purpose? And God has been causing your purpose to chase after the church for all these years. But it's uncomfortable. It's so uncomfortable. Because when you finally find your purpose, that thing that God has placed you on the earth, where he says you are the solution to that thing, it is never a comfortable thing. It's never an easy thing. It's never easy to hear that what we have been busy doing at the church has not been God's will. God's will has been that we seek the salvation, the justice, and the freedom of all people, no matter their skin color, no matter what their background is, no matter where they come from, no matter how they got here. Uncomfortable word. Paul turns around. And he commands her in the mighty name of Jesus, be set free. There's some people in here that need to use the power in you to start to command some things out of your neighborhood. Command some stuff off your street. Oh, God, you know, Brandon, I can see a vision of this church walking street by street by street, praying over that street and declaring that street in Roseville to belong to the mighty name, the strong name, the saving name of Jesus Christ. Right here, right now, these guys go and they set this girl free oh man pastor do i have 10 five more minutes five more minutes 10 more minutes we're good okay as soon as this girl is set free i thought that i was going to read the text and see that there was a celebration that people were excited about it the people were like, wow, it's amazing. She used to be a slave. She, she used to be a slave to this spirit, but now she's, she's set free. I thought that people would be excited about it. But rather than celebrating her freedom, people from the community were upset. And the reason why the people from the community were upset, listen, is because her pain brought them profit. I'm going to give you a perfect example. You guys ready? Are you still on the train? You still with me? There are health problems in our country right now where there are people who are being addicted to opioids. I talked to a doctor the other day. He says, you know, when we look at how we have um, given painkillers over the last few years, we've actually been instructed to give more painkillers to people to help them with their pain. And we're giving them more painkillers over the last decade than we've ever given before. The reason why they did that is because there were drug companies who wanted to see their profits rise. So we create problems that we now become the answer to solve. 
So if someone steps in and really becomes the answer to the opioid problem, it's going to create a problem over here because there are people profiting over, off of other people's pain. When you set people free, there's going to be somebody who's mad. When you set people free, no one is going to come. Everyone is not going to come and slap you on the back and say, thank you for solving that problem. There are going to be some people who are upset. Why? Because there are systems in our world that profit off of people being enslaved. Entire systems built to keep people down. Built to profit off of people's pain. So when God puts that purpose on your life, don't think that anyone is going to come slap you on the back and say, thank you very much for doing your work. Someone is going to come and they're going to call you what they call Paul. You troublemaker. Why couldn't you let that be? Why did you have to talk about that? Why did you have to deal with that issue, you troublemaker? Why did you have to come to work with your Bible in your hand, you troublemaker? Why is it that every time we have a problem on the job, you tell us, well, let's pray about it, you troublemaker? You tr Why are you always disturbing stuff? Why are you always messing stuff up? But God is looking for a radical generation that is looking for God to reroute your steps and so you can get all God's purpose. God is looking for a generation who is willing to be troublemakers to turn things upside down in Sacramento and Roseville and El Grove and California and New York and Florida. Are there any troublemakers in the house? <laughs> troublemakers. I didn't know what it was like to be so agitated and be a troublemaker. So the same kid that I told you about, my son that annoys me, he had to teach me. We were going to church one day, Rachel, and Salem is in the car. And we're about to make, there's a left-hand turn that we got to make at a streetlight. Salem looks out a window, and he sees a homeless man. And we make the left, and he, he says, Mommy, so today at church, we're going to have a potluck, because my church likes to eat. Anybody like to eat? We like to eat. Yeah, yeah. He says, so we're going to have a potluck at church. And Mommy says, right. Then he says, now after the potluck, what happens to the food? And she says, well, whatever is not used is thrown away. My seven-year-old son at the time says, so help me understand this. <laughs> there was a homeless man at the corner that we apparently had nothing to give to. And we go to a church. But that church feels comfortable throwing food away when people in the community have nothing to eat? He said, mama, this can't be. So he came home and he said, Daddy, there's a man that's always at the corner when we go to the church. And the church is busy throwing away food that that man can eat. So let me tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to get a box and I'm going to put it in the lobby of the church. And he didn't ask me if he could. He told me what he was about to do. I'm going to put a lobby, a box in the lobby of the church. And Daddy, you're going to get up and you're going to make an announcement. And you're going to tell the church that the box in the lobby is for a homeless man called Tom. And if you want to give something to Tom, you put it in a box in the lobby. Can I tell you that my son made me make that announcement and then he makes his mom every single week make sure that there's a gift in the back of the car for Tom. Every single Christmas, what are we going to get for Tom? Why? Because he's agitated and he says that can't stay that way. I can't just go to church and have a good time at church when Tom is standing at the corner. And so we got this gift together for Tom for Christmas and I took him over there and while we were going up to Tom, my son wept and cried and he said, Daddy, how is it that he's living over there? He lives there, Dad? He lives under that bridge and with tears in his eyes, my son gave him his gift. My son could not even speak. He said, Daddy, he's Tom. He's somebody's father. He's somebody's uncle. He's somebody's son. He's not just a homeless man and I'm agitated and it can't stay that way. And I won't let it stay that way under my watch. So now my family knows Tom. He's not a homeless man with a sign. He's a man with a name. 
who's being squeezed by the spirit of Python and wants to be free. It wasn't the first time that I learned. I used to uh, teach in my youth group this text. For God, repeat with me, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us love. He's given us power and a sound mind. We used to teach it every, we used to repeat that every single week in youth group. And I would take the youth out on Wednesday night and we would feed the homeless. And I would open up the doors to the, to the van and send them out into the park to feed the homeless. And I stayed in the van because, you know, somebody has to watch the van. <laughs> they go out and they're feeding the homeless and I'm in the van. And one day while they were feeding the homeless and I'm in the van, a nine-year-old comes back to me. She says, Pastor, there's a drug deal happening in the back corner of the park. I said, oh, call all the kids and bring them back to the van. We need to go home. She said, Pastor, there's a drug deal happening in the back corner of the park, and I think that we need to go over there and break it up. <laughs> Agitated. I said, in my head, they ain't paying me for this. I ain't went to school for this. Y'all need to get your behinds into the van, and we need to go home. She was nine. I'm six foot two. She was three foot nothing. She looked up at me, put her hand in her hip, and said, for God has not given me the spirit of... not giving me the spirit of fear he's giving me love power and a sound mind pastor there's a drug deal happening over there and we need to go break it up she grabbed me by the hand led me over to the corner and listen when we got to the corner this nine-year-old grabs the hand of the drug dealer with a wad of money in his hand and she grabs the hand of the woman buying drugs. And she says, is there something we need to pray about? <laughs> she looks at the lady, and the lady says, yeah, I wanna get off drugs. Watch this, watch this. When the spirit is on you. Then she looks at the drug dealer. And she said, sir, is there something I can pray for for you? And he said, yeah. Pray for my children. See? You don't think that drug dealers are sons and husbands and fathers. You don't see, you see them as the squeezers, but you don't recognize that they're also being squeezed. Man, that girl dropped her head and prayed some serious prayer, some demon running prayer, some spirit of python breaking prayer. I kept my eyes open because somebody got to watch to make sure. <laughs> Somebody got to be watching. <laughs> when she was finished praying, the drug dealer stepped into the middle of the park. And he said, all these kids and their pastor is under my protection. They could come to this park whenever they want. And if anyone messes with them, you'll have to deal with me. Why? because she refused to ignore the slave girl walking behind her. She refused to cow down to the spirit of Python, squeezing the life out of her community. And she recognized the power in her to bring systems to an end. And she prayed that power over those two individuals. That spirit is here. 
my question for Rock of Roseville is, are we going to continue to ignore the issues on our own doorstep? Pastor, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. Can I? This is for my church too. And if I offend anyone, please forgive me. Will we support missions beyond and away and ignore the missions on our doorsteps? Will we give our money but not give our time? Ah! Will we play it safe and be the beautiful suburban churches that we are? Or will we say, not on my watch, not on my corner, not in my city, not while I live, because there's a spirit in me, and it's greater than the spirit of Python. There's a spirit. I close with this. There's this guy... True story. He's riding on his ATV and he sees the back of a snake coming out of a grass and he pulls it out and it's a 128 pound python. The python gets his grip around him and he's with a friend and a friend sends him a knife. And the news article says that he starts cutting the head of the python and he doesn't stop cutting. Till the head falls off. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. He doesn't stop cutting till the head falls. Oh, he doesn't stop. He doesn't stop. Oh, God. Oh, God. He doesn't stop cutting till the head fall off. He doesn't stab it once. He doesn't stab it twice. He doesn't send two people with a little bit of money to kind of check it out to get a photo op. He starts cutting and he doesn't stop cutting till the head falls off. I read it and I said, man, that that's amazing. And then Jesus says, I got something more amazing for you because back in the Garden of Eden, there was a snake. And after that snake showed his ugly head, I said that he would bruise your heel. But I said to the church that you will crush his head. So stop tiptoeing on snakes. Put your foot down on the head of the snake and don't stop cutting till the head drops off. Don't stop cutting till the head drops off. Don't stop cutting till the head drops off. Till the head drops off. Till the head drops off. Trust that it will bruise your heel. Not everybody in the city is going to be happy that you're dealing with the homeless. But don't stop cutting till the head falls off. Till that system is broken and that slave is free. I wonder if there's anyone in the building today who wants to be a troublemaker. You want that when you put your two feet on the ground, the devil says, man, she got up. You want to be a troublemaker. If you want to be a troublemaker with me, will you stand with me this evening, this morning, and lift your hands and say, God, I want to be a troublemaker. I don't want to ignore the issues that are on my doorstep. I don't want to ignore the things that are in my community. I want my community to be changed because I'm alive. I want, I want my community to be changed. I want the corner of my street to be changed. I want my whole job to be delivered because I'm there. Is there anybody in the building that wants to be a troublemaker? You're making a commitment today, not just to put 25 cents in the offering plate, not just to go and visit for a while. While, but you ain't gonna stop cutting till the head falls off yeah because you can't just stab at a problem you can't stop until the problem is killed someone in the building says well I don't know what it is that God wants me what was I birthed to solve go back to the text look over your shoulder it's been following you your whole life 
When you were young, it was following you. Something that just burned on your heart that you just can't shake. And every time you change careers, you keep coming back to the same thing. It's been following you. God wants to use you to change it. Today, are you willing to be used to set some people free? Well, I'm going to pray a prayer of disturbance, and everyone in the building is not ready for this prayer. I'm going to be praying that God does not give you peace, that God steals and robs your sleep. That instead of turning off that news article, that newscast, you watch it and you can't take your eyes off of it. That you don't just see immigrants or, or impoverished people or homeless people. You, you don't just see them as some category, but you see them as children of the living God. You just can't shake it. I'm asking God to put something serious on you. That some people in this room will leave your jobs. Some people will get out of school or some people will go to school. Because God won't let you be free. Until they are free. Come on, lift your hands with us today. Come on, lift your hands. Lift your hands. Pastor, would you pray for us? That we will be troublemakers. Father, we just come united together. We say, disturb us, God. Show us what's following us from behind. The family members that you sent. Our way that we get so irritated with. Would you give us the gospel of love? Would you help us live the sacrificial life you called us to lead, Lord? We thank you for sending our brother this way to share a message we needed to hear. We say we will not have deaf ears as a church. But we recognize that you are knocking on the door of this church for a significant mission. Lord, we've done some great things. We've done some good things. But what's the God thing you're bringing our way? And God, as we're called to the unreached, as we're called to the local, we say yes. So right now, say yes to the Holy Spirit. We say yes to what you're disturbing us with. We say yes to what you're bringing our way, no matter how hard it is and how much it costs. We say yes because you gave your life. So Holy Spirit, do a work. But we repent on behalf of our church and others that have said no. We say yes to now. Let this city be a city that is known to seek the Lord with everything it has. Lord, that this would be a, a city that would set other cities on fire. Unite our churches. Unite the body of Christ to be the witness you've called us to be. So God, would you come and bring freedom? Lord, we pray for those even now, eyes closed, that you feel bound like that slave girl. You feel that there's something in your life that has held you and is squeezing the life out of you. And you say, today that power needs to be broken by the power of the cross. Just lift your hand up right now. Father, we declare complete freedom over every addiction, every stronghold, every disturbance that is not of you. And we say the yoke of the enemy must be broken. And freedom from eating disorders, from anxiety, from perversion that's tried to grip and steal the purity of your mind, we say, wash us under your blood. God, we're expected for what you want to do. I want to invite the prayer team forward real quick. Just as I know, as we, your kids desperately want to eat lunch right now. Just letting you know. God, we do make time and are aware of the needs in this house. So we pray for anybody here that needs physical healing in their body. That God, you would do a miraculous work in our midst to realign their hips where there's been lower back pain. God, we just ask that you do a significant work for those that need hope. that are in a place of discouragement. And those that need help, they want to know more about you. God, we say yes to what you're speaking. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give a shout to Jesus? Come on. Let's give it up. Thank you, Pastor Damien.